Reaction Beanie Yo 469. Chat in that neighborhood. My brothers and sisters. After four long weeks, this man has finally released a new video. And that man that I'm talking about is AJ from The Y Files. The Y Files Saturdays, y'all. Hope y'all doing excellent out there today. And I'm glad that you came on back to the channel once again to fuck with the bean. And the title of the video is Anunnaki, Gods from Planet Nibiru and the Makers of Man. Now, AJ has spoke about the Anunnaki in his, some of his past videos, man, but he have never, like, gave us full details on the Anunnaki. You know what I'm saying? He has never told a full story about them. So I'm just very excited to get into this with my brothers and sisters. But before we get into it, y'all know what y'all got to do. Get whatever you may need. Get what you need, please. We back to AJ from the Y Files. Y'all got what y'all need. Y'all ready to go? Then let's and go. This episode of the Y Files is brought to you by Audible. Seven million years ago, a chimpanzee stood up on its hind legs, and a new species of hominin emerged. Over the next few million years, hominins evolved. They were still ape-like in appearance, but these were not apes. Their brains grew larger. They created stone tools and hunted large game. They discovered fire and learned to follow the migration patterns of the animals they used for food, clothing, and shelter. It took a few million years for hominins to discover how to make a stone spearhead. Two million years later, that stone spearhead changed into a different shaped spearhead. Technology evolved slowly. Mm. But 300,000 years ago, Homo sapiens appeared. And before long, they, we, were the dominant species on the planet. Once they destroyed Neanderthals once and for all, something happened. Technology accelerated. It only mm. took 30,000 years to go from Gobekli Tepe to landing probes on other planets. How could mankind evolve so fast? The answer is, they couldn't. Mankind didn't evolve at all. Mankind was engineered, purpose-built to be the perfect slaves for a race of far superior beings who, according to ancient texts, descended from the heavens. Eventually, the slaves rebelled, and our masters tried to destroy us in a great flood. Sumerian texts, Egyptian religions, ancient Indian myths, Native American legends, even the Bible, they all tell the same story. It's the story of gods and men. It's the story of the Anunnaki. Get whatever you may need. AJ with his commercial. Shout out to Hucklefish. I always got to say that. Shout out to Hucklefish. But man, listen, y'all. The thing that just stood out to me the most right there, and it's something that I've always thought about too, is how like technology, as time goes on, it speeds up even more. You know what I'm saying? Like it took millions of years, and then it started to take a couple of thousands of years for us to get to where we are today. You know what I'm saying? Way back then when they was first creating those spears, it took millions of freaking years for them to get the spear even better. But now, look at us. You know what I'm saying? Like as years go on, technology just get faster and faster and faster. Like we just advancing so quick now. It's, it's a great time to live in 2024 you alive in 2004 you alive in a great time man i think we're gonna let's go back right here let's do it mesopotamia is called the cradle of civilization long before the pyramids soared above egypt and ages before stonehenge was built 
the ancient civilization of Sumer thrived. Sure, we have sites like Gobekli Tepe and Mokuklu Tarla, which predate the Sumerians, but those are small gathering places compared to the vast civilization of Sumer, the world's first empire. The Sumerians invented writing. They discovered the wheel. The sailboat was first created by the Sumerians. They revolutionized agriculture by inventing the first plow to be used on farms fed by a sophisticated irrigation system. Again, the world's first. Though the Greeks get credit for inventing city-states, that too was a Sumerian concept. Sumer mm. was organized into city-states, each governed independently with its own ruler. These rulers reported to the king according to the Code of Urnamu, the world's first legal system. Sumerians understood complicated mathematics and astronomy. Their number systems used to tell time and measure the angles of a circle are still used today. Wow. Sumer was founded about 7,000 years ago. And you probably know everything I've said so far. This is common knowledge. What's also common knowledge is that Homo sapiens, or modern man, appeared about 300,000 years ago. Look at how much our technology has evolved since the Sumerians. It took only 7,000 years to go from discovering writing to landing a man on the moon. That's what I'm saying, man. Like, it, it, it's a little scary how fast technology is advancing nowadays, y'all. Huh. Okay, to landing something on the moon. Better. So what took so long? Why the sudden explosion of technology? What was modern man doing for the 225,000 years or so before ancient Sumer? Why did technology not progress? Mm, ancient question. Sumerian texts tell us why. Technology couldn't progress because humans were busy working. Working the mines. Working on a coal mine, going down, down, down. Working on a coal mine, woo, I gotta slip down. Oh, they weren't mining for coal. They were mining for gold. Hmm. Gold is a miraculous metal. It's an excellent conductor, highly useful in electronics, and crucial to space travel. Radioactive gold isotopes can target and destroy cancer cells. Gold can also be used for data processing and transmission. Before the 20th century, humans had no practical use for gold. It's nice to look at, but they couldn't use it for anything. Have you ever wondered why a metal, useless to ancient humans, suddenly and only very recently became the most valuable metal in the world? Gold has other uses. Gold nanoparticles can clean the environment. Gold facilitates chemical reactions that purify water and air by leaching away toxic compounds. That's where the sky gods of Sumer come in, the Anunnaki. Mm. Why are you saying it like that? Anunnaki, it's the new jingle, like a, we are farmers, bam, 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 and yeah, I'm loving it. Anunnaki, Anunnaki, Anunnaki. Uh, you think it will stick? Uh, no, that's just a ripoff of Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Gold was more than the most valuable metal in the world. It was the most valuable metal in the solar system. The Anunnaki weren't gods. They were aliens from another planet. They needed gold to save their world from an environmental disaster. But gold was rare on their planet. They found a solution. About 450,000 years ago, the Anunnaki arrived on Earth not to help humans, but to use them. Gold is abundant on Earth. The Anunnaki knew this, and they wanted every ounce of it. So they bred us as a slave race to work the mines. The planet of the Anunnaki, hiding in the far reaches of our solar system, does exist. Not just according to ancient tablets, but according to NASA. The home world of the Anunnaki has been called the 12th planet by Zechariah Sitchin. NASA calls it Planet 9. Others call it Planet X. The Sumerians and the Anunnaki called their planet Nibiru. And the fates of Nibiru and Earth were about to be joined together forever. Mmm, this is getting very interesting, y'all. Like, one thing I just want to say, and hey, I always say AJ educates me on a lot of things when I watch his videos with y'all. And one thing is that I did not know gold had all that value as far as like use case value. You know what I'm saying, man? Gold could be used for a lot of different things, my brothers and sisters. This is a hey, man, these Anunnaki's, I don't know. I don't know. Was they slaving people way, 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 way back in the day, making them search for gold because they wanted the gold and that's why technology wasn't advancing so fast back then? 
I don't know, my brothers and sisters. Let's see. Anu stood on his balcony and laughed to himself. His laugh wasn't about anything funny. It was a sarcastic laugh. Anu wasn't his given name. Anu was his title, given to all leaders of his people, the Anunnaki. Anunnaki. Please, no catchy jingles when I'm doing dramatic science fiction. Sorry, sorry. Uh, go ahead, Philip K. Dick. 50... <laughs> <laughs> 50,000 years ago, when Anu was young and ambitious, he fought former King Alalu for the throne and won. The council elected him to see Nibiru through the crisis. But during his time as leader, conditions on the planet were only getting worse. Industry on Nibiru was highly controlled. Factories polluted the air. There was no way to avoid it, but they had the technology to control it. Hmm. Skyscraper-sized air recyclers dotted the landscape around every urban area. However, a series of volcanic eruptions caught the Anunnaki by surprise. Ancient volcanoes spewed ash and toxic gas into the air, overwhelming the recyclers with mountain-sized pyroclastic flows. Within weeks, the recyclers began to fail. Within months, the atmosphere began breaking down. Nibiru's ozone layer was thin in most places and completely gone in others. Damn. The sky above Nibiru was a sickly yellow, and the atmosphere was thick and oppressive. Twin moons once shined brightly. Now they were barely visible through the haze. Stars that had once filled the night sky could no longer be seen. Anunnaki lived for 200,000 years. This long lifespan, once considered a gift, was now a curse. The older Anunnaki remembered a night sky filled with stars, but the young ones had never seen a star. The last, wow. brightest star disappeared behind the gloom years ago. In the cities of Nibiru, the towering spires of ancient buildings loomed over empty streets. The grand avenues, once lined with breathtaking sculptures and shimmering fountains, now seemed to taunt the Anunnaki a painful reminder of an age of prosperity now long in the past. The gardens that once bloomed with exotic plants and flowers were now withered and brown. Formerly vibrant landscapes were barren and decayed, a casualty of the failing ecosystem. And the thing that I'm wondering right now, y'all, is like, could this possibly happen on Earth one day? You know what I'm saying? With nat natural disasters like volcanoes and all that just break down the earth ecosystem then we get to a point where our sky filled with freaking gas or haze or whatever and then now we can't see the freaking stars and the, the, the freaking all, all all our plants and just everything just start to just decay over time over time everything just start dying here on earth i think that shit is possible that it could happen i just hope it don't happen in my lifetime <laughs> oh no man let's go Anu and the Anunnaki people knew that their planet was dying and that they were running out of time. Anu had the greatest minds in the world working on this problem, but the outlook was grim. Then Anu's son Enlil burst into the room. He said, Father, I know how we can save the planet. By coming to Earth and enslaving humans. That's crazy, man. In the Halls of Learning, the greatest minds of Nibiru worked tirelessly to find a solution. They pored over ancient texts and conducted countless experiments, searching for a way to halt the decay of their world. And then, in a moment of desperation and brilliance, Anunnaki scientists discovered the answer. Gold. The precious metal, rare on Nibiru, held the key to their salvation. When suspended in the atmosphere, microscopic gold reflects and absorbs the harmful radiation of the sun in space. It was the one chance to stabilize their atmosphere. It was a long shot and would take years, but it was their only hope. The Anunnaki mobilized all their resources and devised a plan. They sent expeditions to the far reaches of the solar system, searching for planets rich in gold. They would mine the gold, bring it back to their planet, and release it into the atmosphere in a desperate attempt to save their world. For years, probes went out, and probes found nothing. Probes traveled the inner solar system and found nothing but useless volcanic rock and toxic gas. 
But today, there was a glimmer of hope. One of the probes reported not just the presence of gold, but of many more life-saving resources. All the elders were present at the council meeting. Enki, Inanna, Ninhursag, and Utu. But it was Anu's son and Lil who spoke first. Data from one of our probes has come in. There is a planet very close to the yellow star, rich in gold. It also has liquid water in abundance. Its atmosphere is thin, thinner than ours, but it has a strong magnetic field that shields it from the radiation killing our planet. It's the third planet from the star. Anu knew of this planet. They called it Kai, but would later become known as Earth. Earth revolved around the sun very quickly. Nibiru was also in orbit around the star, but it took 3,600 Earth years to complete one revolution. Dang. Anu thought Earth sounded perfect. The journey would be dangerous, but times were desperate. Soon, Nibiru would be making a close approach to Earth. The timing was perfect. He urged them to depart immediately, but Enlil had more to say. But Earth is teeming with life, including intelligent creatures, though still early in their development. These creatures are bipedal like us, but smaller than us, perhaps half our height. The creatures Enlil spoke of were under six feet tall. Anunnaki were between 12 and 15 feet tall, this is because Nibiru's gravity wasn't as strong as Earth's. This was just math. More gravity means smaller life forms. Low gravity allows plants and animals to grow very tall. Aside from their small size, the Earth creatures were similar in appearance to the Anunnaki in other ways. The Anunnaki had larger eyes and larger skulls than the Earthlings. But the Earth beings had two arms, two legs, eyes, nose, mouth, just like the Anunnaki. Anu sensed concern in Enlil's voice. Do these Earth creatures pose a threat to us and our project? They are primitive, but violent. Some eat animal flesh, if you can imagine. They have no interest in gold, but they may perceive us as a threat. They have no technology beyond wood and stone. Still, in numbers, they could be dangerous. That's what the Ajiji are for. The Ajiji the were a race of slaves who served the Anunnaki in all things from operating the factories to maintaining order. They were an intelligent and obedient workforce, and they could surely handle primitive creatures half their size. The council convened, the decision was made, and 300 Anunnaki and 600 Ajiji were loaded onto great ships. It was time to make the journey sunward. It was time to make the journey to Earth. Man, I know this is just science fiction, but dude, it is so freaking interesting to me, man. Like, dude, a match, like, and then even if you want to say this shit science fiction, in a way, it's believable because we can, we really don't have. And I have said this before in all the Wi-Fi videos, and I'm gonna say it again. We really ain't got no recordings of what was happening back when freaking monkeys was turning into humans. You know what I'm saying? During that time period of the first Homo sapiens and stuff, we ain't got no real history of that. There's no video. You know, there's no pictures. So who's to say aliens didn't come down here at some point back then, y'all? Anyway. Let's go. Don't don't make me go on my little rant, my little ch tangents. Let's go. After a brief stop on Mars, the Anunnaki fleet arrived in Earth's orbit. The crew was stunned. The planet was a vibrant blue and green with swirling white clouds. Vast glimmering oceans seemed to go on forever. The planet was full of life in the sky, on land, and the sea below. Yeah, Anunnaki. Mm -hmm. The Anunnaki marveled at Earth's beauty, but also felt sadness. Their home planet Nibiru was dying, and its people were suffering. But that sadness renewed their resolve. They were here for a purpose, mine all the gold needed to heal their atmosphere. Anunnaki. A few ships remained in orbit, while others scouted the planet for a suitable landing site. Eventually, they settled on the lush green plains between the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers. Later, this area would become known as Mesopotamia, the Greek word for between two rivers. The ships landed and the Ajiji were put to work. The Ajiji were a race of aliens that the Anunnaki conquered long ago. After the Ajiji were defeated, they were enslaved. They've served the Anunnaki ever since. The Ajiji look similar to the Anunnaki who look similar to modern humans. Yeah, there's a reason for that. I'm getting there. 
just, I, I just had, I gotta wonder, y'all. I'm wondering it in my brain, and now I gotta see it. I just gotta see it, man. What do freaking aliens like a, a gang of aliens, hundreds of them, like the uh, Anunnaki and the uh, GGs and all that stuff right there? What if they come back to Earth right now? What if they come to Earth right now? I'm talking about in hundreds of ships, my brothers and sisters. A lot of these mother and try to like not kill us, but enslave us right now as I speak, my brothers and sisters. In the next five minutes, y'all just start seeing goddamn space spaceships just flying all over the sky. How would us as a human society react to that? How would we react? Would you be a slave, or will you try to kill these freaking aliens? Take your chances. Are you? Are you what? What you gonna do, man? What the? Are we gonna do? How would? The world respond. I don't know, man. It's a. It might sound crazy, y'all, but it's a fun thought to me. Like I don't know why I get excited thinking about that. I love being weird over here on the Wi-Fi on Saturdays. Let's go. The GG were between 12 and 15 feet tall and extremely strong. Where humans have somewhat round skulls, the Anunnaki and the Ajiji to some degree have very large and often elongated skulls. These elongated heads have been depicted many times in ancient carvings and frescoes. The Ajiji were given only seven days to build the great city of Eridu, to be ruled by Anu's son, Enki. The Anunnaki were cruel and brutal to the Ajiji. The god's load was great. The toil grievous, the trouble excessive. The great Aranaki, the seven, were making me a Gigi undertake the toil. The city was completed on time. Then the Ajiji dug mines and began mining gold. They mined gold day after day, year after year, for 150,000 years. Damn. The Ajiji extracted gold by the ton, and ships began making round trips between Earth and Nibiru. Enki, ruling in his father Anu's name, was thrilled. He demanded more output. The slave masters used weapons like particle beams to force the Ajiji to work harder and faster. Enki didn't want to abuse the workforce this way, but felt he had no choice. The atmosphere on Nibiru was all but stripped away. He wasn't sure the gold would get back home in time. Then, against his better judgment, Enki demanded even more output from the mines. The slave masters were told to use any means necessary to get this done, including torture. Soon whispers of dissent circulated among the Ajiji. Then the whispers became shouts. No longer would the Ajiji allow themselves to be tortured, and no longer would they work the mines. Atrahasis, mm. a famous leader of the Ajiji, made the decision to rebel. Mm. Damn, Ajiji's got tired of y'all working their ass like that, man. Got them. They was mining tons of freaking gold. That's crazy. For too long have we languished under the yoke of the Aranaki. We were born of the stars, yet condemned to the dark. It is time we seek the light. Now, proclaim war. Let us combine hostilities and battle. The rebellion was swift. The Ujiji were intelligent and strong. They turned their tools into weapons, broke their chains, and fought the Anunnaki for their freedom. The city of Eridu became a battlefield, and gold mines collapsed from the uprising. The Ajiji fought bravely, but they failed and were put wow. back in chains. Wow. Enki's brother and Leel had been overseeing the mining operations. He was furious. He wanted the Ajiji killed for treason, but Enki felt differently. The Anunnaki and the Ajiji had thousands of years of shared history. Shall we meet defiance with tyranny? Or can we forge a new destiny together? The Ajiji could not return to the mines, and Enki knew this. They would continue to rebel. But someone had to work the mines and do all the labor a large city requires. So Enki had an idea. In the forests were ape-like hominids. They had large brains, walked on two legs, and could use simple tools. They weren't intelligent enough to do the work the Anunnaki needed, but maybe they could become intelligent with just a little genetic engineering. What the hell? There were groups of hominids living in the forest around the Anunnaki cities. These were our ancestors. They were either Homo heidelbergensis or Homo erectus. Yeah. Stop it. The Anunnaki took one of the hominid males and attempted to cross his genetics with the Anunnaki. Yeah, Anunnaki. 
Enki wanted to create a creature that would be intelligent like the Ajiji, but not too intelligent. They would be strong, but much smaller than the Ajiji. They would be engineered to be submissive and much easier to control. The first experiments were done in a lab, and the results were horrific. Instead of creating a perfect being, the genetic experiments created monsters. Mm. Gorgons, cyclops, banshees, and two-headed giants. These monsters still live on in ancient stories. The Anunnaki changed their approach. They genetically spliced their DNA with that of a hominid female. Then, rather than grow the embryo in a lab, they implanted it in the female. It worked. Less than a year later, a child was born, a boy. He looked more like the Anunnaki than the ape-like creatures roaming the forest. They named the child Adamu. Adamu, like a, like Adam from Adam and Eve? Yep, Adamu means first man. In Hebrew, the word also means from the ground or earth. In Genesis, God made Adam in his own image from the dust on the ground. In ancient Sumerian, Akkadian, and Babylonian texts, the creation of man is described the same way. Man is created in the image of the god or gods by mixing the blood of a god with the clay of the earth. Ancient Egyptians had a story of man being created by mixing a tear of a god with the clay of the earth. Blood, or even a tear, would contain DNA. And clay in ancient writings doesn't mean actual clay, it refers to all life on earth. Every culture and religion has some variation of this story. Not a coincidence. Probably not. Mm. And there is that gap in history where hominids go from very simple primates to a very intelligent, advanced race. We're far more intelligent than any of the species before us. You'd think there'd be a slow but steady evolution of intelligence, but we yeah. don't see it. It's as if humans suddenly appeared. Dr. Ellis Silver wrote a book about this jump in evolution in his book, Humans Are Not From Earth. That, that's what I'm sitting right here thinking about right now, y'all. The possibility that maybe all of us, all of us are freaking aliens. You know what I'm saying? Like, our origin do not start on Earth because of the freaking Anunnaki's not having sex with all primate women back in the day, whatever. Not that they, they actually implanted their DNA or whatever into them. But all I'm saying is, y'all, it would be so crazy if we come from another alien race. Like, that's how we advanced as humans. That would be just mind-blowingly crazy if one day we really can prove it to be true. Let's go. His theory says that humans were brought here by aliens. Now, whether brought here or created here, the theory says humans were genetically engineered using alien DNA. Dr. Silver claims that humans are not well suited to Earth's environment, while every other animal is. Why did we lose our fur? Human skin is very sensitive to sunlight and UV radiation. If we spend too much time in the sun, it leads to serious diseases, especially skin cancer. No other animals get sunburned. Mammals have fur or thick skin. Fish scales, even birds' feathers, all offer protection from the sun. Sure, pigs, elephants, and even reptiles can get burned, but they protect themselves by rolling around in mud or changing their skin. Now we have sunblock, but what did humans do to protect their skin 100,000 years ago? Also, humans are more susceptible to illness, disease, and birth disorders than other animals. I have two cats. I've had cats for years. I can't remember them ever getting sick. Buddy eventually got sick, but then he died. For 14 years, he never had so much as a cold. Now, I know cats, dogs, and animals do get sick, but not at the rate humans do. Dr. Silver mentions that humans tend to crave food that's bad for us. Salt, sugar, fat, carbs. We're surrounded by vegetables, nuts, and fruit, but most people would rather have a cheeseburger, fries, and a milkshake. I know I would. Back pain is another reason Dr. Silver thinks humans are not from Earth. He claims we're not designed for Earth's gravity. It's too heavy. He believes we evolved on a planet with lower gravity. Like Nibiru. Right. Hmm. The Anunnaki were very human-like, but they were about twice our height, 12 to 15 feet tall. This would indicate they evolved on a planet with lower gravity than Earth. He presents a very compelling case backed up by science. I link to his book below. 
Hey, he do present like a, a good compelling case. Like humans, we do have a lot of freaking flaws, y'all, that don't make sense with us being on Earth. And the major one that AJ said at the beginning is like, why do we lose our fur? You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know, man. It's like the way we evolve kind of make it feel like we did come from freaking Anunnaki. <laughs> That we did come from Nabiru, man. I don't know, y'all. But another one is too, like dogs, animals, period, man. But I'm just talking about dogs because I've had plenty of dogs in my life. They don't really get sick like that. You know what I'm saying? But humans, we get sick all the damn time. Like who have evolved more or better? I should say humans or dogs. <laughs> Let's go. It's believed that Homo sapiens first emerged about 300,000 years ago. This is exactly the time of the Ajiji Rebellion. So back to the first man, Adamu. The Anunnaki also created a female, Hiva, so they could- When I get that feeling, I want sexual healing, sexual healing. It's good for me. I continue. The Anunnaki needed humans to procreate on their own, and they did often. The Anunnaki guided this new race for a few hundred years. The population grew to thousands. The Anunnaki taught the new humans all the skills they needed to maintain the city, build homes, plant and harvest crops. But most importantly, the Anunnaki gave humans the skills to mine gold. Yeah, Anunnaki! The Anunnaki were so pleased with their creation that they allowed humans to visit their sacred garden, Eden. So uh, Adamo mm. and Heva in the Garden of Eden, eh? According to ancient Sumerian writing, yes. Sounds familiar. Yep, there is a lot of the Anunnaki story in every major religion in the world. But now we run into a problem. Humans didn't look like apes at all. They looked pretty much like Anunnaki, just smaller. And human women were beautiful. Uh-oh, that always means trouble. One of these women caught the eye of Enki, the Anunnaki ruler of the city Eridu. Yeah, and there it is. Hey, Enki, her eyes are up here. But relationships mm -hmm. between Anunnaki, Ajiji, and humans were strictly forbidden. Don't sleep with the help. Oh, come on, that's rude. I'm serious. You get in trouble when you party with your employees. Just ask Arnold and uh, Ben Affleck. So Enki broke the law and had a relationship with a human woman. From this relationship, a child was born, a boy named Adapa. Until now, humans were very simple, docile beings, intelligent enough to do the work the Anunnaki needed, but not intelligent enough to complain about it. The birth of Adapa changed everything. He was part human, part Anunnaki. He was extremely intelligent. He married a woman named Atiti. Atiti? Atiti. What I say? From the family of Adapa began a new line of highly intelligent humans, and they started asking questions. They inherited the Anunnaki's desire for gold and for power. But there was a bigger problem. Another trait emerged in this new line of intelligent humans, a trait that would shape the future of our entire species. That new trait was violence. Mm. So that's what, uh, what the name, Aditi? The Wi-Fi ought to say so many different names. I, I'm forgetting right now. But the, the the ruler of the Anunnaki, when he seen one of those first humans or whatever you want to call them, one of the beautiful ladies, and he decided to have a baby with him and created uh, Aditi. I think that's the right name for him. Once he created like the soup, I'm not going to say superhuman, but that's the point where humans started to have like a conscience, like really no wrong for right or started to think on their own or whatever y'all y'all get what i'm saying like i feel like that that was the freaking moment man that was the moment in just a few years the first generation submissive humans were gone some were murdered but most just died out the new humans had no interest in mating with them but they still were interested in mating get up get up get up get up Let's make love tonight. Against the orders of the Anunnaki, these new, intelligent, violent humans procreated a lot. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, because you do it right. Soon the city of Eridu was overrun. It could no longer sustain the human population. People were killing each other for food, 
the violence was out of control. And Leal was especially annoyed by the constant disturbance of humans. He decided to lessen the population by sending a series of plagues. First drought, then pestilence, and then famine. After each of these plagues, the humans appealed to the god who made them, Enki. He helped ease their suffering and return the earth to its natural state. By now, the Anunnaki had enough gold to heal their planet, and the humans had become a nuisance. The Anunnaki cast them out of Eden and out of Eridu, and from there the human race spread around the world. But not all humans left. Some stayed and had relationships with several Anunnaki. The children born of these relationships were extremely powerful demigods. Hmm. Legendary figures like Gilgamesh, Samson, Hercules, and Perseus were the offspring of Anunnaki human unions. But some humans had relationships with the Ajiji. These unions did not produce heroes, they produced monsters. These offspring were a race of giants called the Nephilim. They were cruel and brutal. They tormented and tortured humans, and in many cases, they ate them. Nephilim episode, wow. link below. Meanwhile, mankind flourished. Human settlements became cities, and cities became empires. Humans conquered all four corners of the earth. It was a prosperous, if not decadent time. But the human race didn't know their world was about to change, drastically. It first appeared in the night sky like any other star, but as the weeks passed, the object grew brighter and larger. Humans were confused and growing concerned. They had no idea what this object was, but the Anunnaki did. It was their home. Nibiru takes 3,600 years to orbit the sun, but its orbit is highly elliptical, so Nibiru travels way beyond Pluto, nearly to the Kuiper Belt, then swings all the way back through the inner solar system. During this time, wow. it comes very close to the Earth. So the Anunnaki started packing. They had enough gold to heal their atmosphere. There was no reason to stay on Earth anymore. Besides, when Nibiru got close to the Earth, they did not want to be on the surface. No, it sounds ominous. Oh yeah, it's gonna be bad. How bad? Well, imagine every disaster movie you've ever seen rolled into one cataclysmic event. Okay, that's bad. It's actually way worse. Yeah, but what about the humans? Oh, after Nibiru passes by the Earth? There won't be any humans left. Oh, no. What the fuck? So what the hell is AJ saying? Is he saying that the freaking all the humans with the uh, uh, the Anunnaki's and the GG's and all the inter maiden going on that they was doing is all that just going to be washed away? Was all that just washed away when uh, Nibiru came back close to the Earth? That'll be crazy. That'll be a huge swerve, man. Let's see. The farmer was startled awake. The sun was just rising over the mountains in the east. The animals always got restless at sunrise, eagerly awaiting their breakfast. But the animals were more than restless. They were going crazy. His wife groaned and rolled over as he launched himself out of bed. When he got to his barn, the farmer was shocked. His horses were literally screaming to get out of their stalls. One broke its neck trying to break free. His sheep were running in unison like a flock of birds, making a large circle within the pen. Occasionally, one would break off and throw itself against the stone corral. A few injured sheep limped around the perimeter. At least two were dead. It was madness. The farmer didn't know what caused the sudden alarm, but he was sure it had something to do with the object in the sky. His village first noticed it months ago when a new light appeared in the night sky. It looked like a star, as the sky gods called it. But the sky gods were gone now. After the new star appeared, they boarded great chariots that took them to the heavens. His people were on their own now. The object no longer looked like a star. It was almost the size of the moon. And like the moon, the farmer could see features on the great disk. Clouds were visible. He could see mountains and oceans. But wow. unlike the moon, the object was visible during the day constant and oppressive. He knew it was getting larger, or was it getting closer? It was difficult to tell. The farmer jumped when a flock of birds suddenly and loudly took flight. 
He scanned the forest and horizon beyond, and it seemed like every bird in the world had taken to the air. But there were no songs being sung. The birds were screeching. Then he felt it, a vibration. At first he thought it was his body trembling, but then realized the ground beneath his feet was trembling. The farmer felt the sound before he heard it, a hum so deep it was barely there, but the sound caused a wave of sickness to wash over him. He dropped to his knees to vomit when the world started tearing itself apart. He had experienced earthquakes before, some very powerful and frightening, nothing compared to this. The ground shook and rolled like a boat at sea. Over his shoulder, he saw the barn crumble. He wondered how many of his horses were killed. He hoped his favorite horse survived. He wanted to run over and save what animals he could, but the tremor would not allow him to stand. Then his house collapsed. Damn. The farmer vomited again, knowing his wife and three children were still sleeping there. He hoped they slept through their death. They didn't. I ain't lying, man. This is like the, the, all your worst fears of natural disasters put together right now. He heard his wife screaming from the rubble. He heard the wail of an infant. Then he heard himself screaming. But those sounds were suddenly overwhelmed by a great rumble as the ground lurched forward. The stone corral tumbled. Animals were knocked off their feet. Deafening thunder came next, but louder than any thunder he'd ever heard. The farmer covered his ears, but it was no help. What he couldn't hear, he could feel. He looked to the west. There was the grassy hill with the large olive tree. As far as he knew, the tree had been there forever. The graves of his parents and their parents were in the shade of that tree. He thought his grave might be there soon. Then from over that ridge, he saw what seemed to be mountains of fire. Flaming stones as big as houses were launched into the sky, through the clouds, and into the heavens. Hundreds of them, thousands maybe. Dark smoke billowed from something in that direction. And before he knew it, the blue sky had turned black. The morning sun had disappeared. But at least he didn't have to look at the great disk anymore. He finally got to his feet and staggered toward his house. All he could hear was the growl of the earth, but he knew his wife was still alive. If he could just get to her, maybe he could... Then a hot coal landed beside him, the kind he'd seen in ovens at the market. It was bright red and a flame. Then another coal landed nearby, this one a bit larger. They hissed as they burned in the tall grass. He then realized the rocks of fire that were launched into the heavens were coming home. Soon stones made of fire were crashing all around him, and they were getting bigger. The barn disappeared in a hail of fire. On the ground, he saw the shadows. The stones were definitely getting larger, and they were bigger than houses, much bigger. It's just so crazy, man, because all of this right now that is happening is because of freaking Nibiru being close to Earth. That's it, that's the reason. That's crazy. The farmer stopped when one of the large shadows found him. He knew what was next. He said a prayer as the faint shadow on the grass grew larger and darker. He heard an approaching scream as the shadow spilled across his entire farm. Then everything went black. All because of Nibiru. The fisherman was working frantically. The great disk in the sky was shaking the earth and buildings were crumbling as if made of sand. He lashed ropes around a wooden pike to hold his boat in place. The waves were growing bigger and his boat was thrashing violently. He hoped his knot would hold. Occasionally, a brick made of fire would drop from the sky and land in the water with an angry hiss. The fisherman was more confused than frightened. The morning was clear and peaceful and the fish were biting. He was gonna make a fortune at the market, but the storm had cut his trip short. Now a blanket of darkness covered the earth and the wind was howling. Soon the wind's howl became a roar and rain thrashed so violently that the drops left painful welts in his skin. The Damn. earth had been shaking for hours, or was it just minutes he couldn't tell. When the small houses in the village fell, countless lives were lost, but there were some survivors. They were making their way to the caves nearby. 
The tremors made it slow going, but the fisherman was sure they'd make it. A gust of wind felt like a shove that knocked the fisherman off his feet. But this shove continued and continued. The wind was so strong, the man was pinned to the ground, face painfully pushing into the sand. Any houses that survived the quake would not survive this gale. He was being pelted with sand and debris, and boats that weren't tied down sailed through the air, exploding into splinters when they landed. He once again hoped that not would hold. He managed to get to his feet as soil and dust whirled around him. He couldn't see more than two paces in any direction. Unsure of where to go, he followed the sound of a child crying. But that child sounded so far, far away. Then, as if the sky gods had commanded it, the wind and rain stopped. What? Debris fell to the ground as if dropped by the gods' hands. The earth stopped trembling, though he could still feel a rumble somewhere down deep. It could be the sound of hell itself. He saw a few stragglers wearing heavy packs on their way to the caves. Behind him, he heard a familiar sound, the sound of a river, but there were no rivers near the village. He turned around and saw that the sea had all but disappeared. Water was rushing Damn. away at a ferocious speed, but to where? Soon the ocean was a field of mud that stretched to the horizon. His boat dangled from the wooden pike, the knot held. Thousands of fish wriggled and flopped in the wet sand where the ocean used to be. He thought this would be the greatest feast the birds would ever see. Then he realized there were no birds, not a single one. With the water gone, the only sound was that of fish flipping over and over again, slowly drowning in the air. The fisherman's eyes continued to the horizon. He saw a great white cloud stretch from one end of the world to the other. He stood silently in awe. Then he realized it wasn't a cloud, it was a mountain, and it was growing. But how could it be a mountain? It was a mountain of water, a wave. Whoa. The biggest wave he'd ever seen. The biggest wave anyone had ever seen. As it approached, its crest pierced the clouds, taller than any mountain, higher than any bird could fly, bigger than anything the fisherman had ever seen. His father had taught him how to steady his boat when a big wave hits, but his father never mentioned a wave that touched the heavens. Soon Can you imagine a freaking wave? Like I, I feel like you can't even call that a wave. We gotta get that another name. A freaking wave that literally goes to the clouds that freaking big. Man, I feel like a wave like that will literally like take out at least a, a state in the United States. At least a state will flood the whole freaking state. No, that shit might take out the whole United States, man. I don't know, y'all, but can you even imagine something like that? Whoa. Soon, what little light seeped through the gloom was snuffed out by the shadow of the wall of water. The wave rushed ahead at great speed. The man thought that not even the finest, fastest horse could outrun it. Within seconds, the wall of water was all he could see. It was coming. The man sighed and settled his breath. He'd been born by the sea, and he would die by the sea. This would be a good death. He closed his eyes, opened his arms wide, and smiled. And all of this is happening because of freaking Nibiru, planet, getting close to Earth. That's the main thing I'm stuck on. In orbit, the Anunnaki watched the continents of the Earth sink beneath the ocean. Tiny islands, once the peaks of great mountains, appeared here and there, but there were too few for anyone to survive, for anything to survive. They knew the great flood was coming. Nibiru passes by the Earth every 3,600 years, but the distance varies. Sometimes Nibiru stays far outside the moon's orbit and the effects on Earth are small. But sometimes, like this visit, Nibiru is soared between the Earth and the moon at 40,000 miles per hour. The Anunnaki Ooh. knew the Earth would be devastated. In the months prior, there was a lot of debate among the elder Anunnaki. Yeah, Anunnaki. At first, they decided to let humanity perish. And Leel said that humans served their purpose and now were nothing but a nuisance. A great flood was just what the earth needed, a fresh start. But Enki had grown to love humans. Remember, he married a human woman. Enki offered Enlil and the other Anunnaki a compromise. 
The flood would come as planned, but one man and his family would be spared. Utnapishtim, a wise and good man. He and his wife and family would build a large boat. An ark. Yes, and on that boat, they would take the seeds of all living creatures. When the flood came, all life on earth was destroyed, but Utnapishtim, his family, and the contents of his boat survived. Every day, Utnapishtim released birds to find land. One day, a raven did not return. He sailed in that direction. After a few days, the boat came to rest on an island that, as the waters receded, became a mountaintop. And now life, including humanity, would start again. Ah, uh, that's the story of Noah's Ark. It is. Yeah. But this version is from the Epic of Gilgamesh, written at least 3,000 years earlier. And the story's probably much older than that. Every culture and religion on Earth has a flood myth, which are all very similar to the Sumerian flood myth. Some cultures tell the identical story just with different names. So mankind is reborn. But this time, the Anunnaki put in some safeguards. They shortened the human lifespan. They made us more susceptible to illness. They made childbirth dangerous for both mother and child. They would not let the human population get out of control. Oh, Bill Gates and the World Economic Forum would be proud. They would. You're gonna live in a pod and eat bugs, you know. I am not eating bugs. Oh, worms are pretty good. I like sushi. Your jibe cuts me, sir. It cuts me to the quick. <laughs> Soon, new settlements and villages emerged. But all of humanity's previous knowledge was lost to the sea. They were back to the Stone Age. Enki and even Enlil were impressed by the resilience of man and decided to visit the settlements. The Anunnaki descended from the heavens and rose from the seas to give people the gift of civilization. Humans are taught reading and writing, mathematics, astronomy, and even engineering. They're taught how to build great cities. And some believe the Anunnaki helped them build huge structures like pyramids and obelisks found in Egypt and South America. Okay, I'm finna say something that I know gonna sound stupid, y'all, but I'ma say it, man. I think that it is very I just think that it is very freaking plausible that some aliens or something from another planet came down to Earth and helped humans build them freaking all uh, them fucking pyramids and shit, man. How in the hell way, 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 way back in the day before we was had any of the technology that we have now, before we are we are nowhere near as advanced as we are now back then how did those humans build those fucking structures y'all the pyramids are freaking huge and not only that the thing that killed me is the precision of the freaking pyramids like they are so perfect in, in the, the freaking ratios and all that man like there are there it's like they uh it it if, if it was if it was a freaking pain, it would be a 10 out of 10, the pyramids, man. Like, how did they build those monuments so perfectly way, way, way back then, my brothers and sisters? Long story short, short story long, I believe that it's possible that some freaking aliens helped them out. Let's go. And those pyramids and obelisks were built for a specific purpose, by the way. Tesla might have figured it out, but that's another story. Tesla pyramid link below. The last time Nibiru passed by Earth was about 700 years ago. That time happens to coincide with the emergence of the Sumerian civilization, the first civilization on Earth. Or was it? Nibiru passes by Earth every 3,600 years. Sometimes Nibiru comes so close to the Earth that the planet is wiped clean. About 13,000 years ago, the end of the Younger Dryas was the time of the Great Flood. This coincides with a time when Nibiru would be passing by. Some believe a meteor impact caused the flood. Others believe it was a major solar event. But what if it was Nibiru that caused the ice sheets to melt and flood the earth? What if that's the exact story that we've heard today? The earliest mm. great flood myth comes from ancient Sumer about 7,000 years ago. However, tablets and tablets of Sumerian writing still exist. Writing that fills books upon books the Sumerians wrote down everything. They said the great flood story, which was told in the Epic of Gilgamesh, happened many years earlier. The dates work out. And if the Sumerians were right, there was a civilization on Earth before the flood, as many researchers like Graham Hancock claim. Now that previous civilization didn't have advanced technology, 
but they certainly witnessed it. Carvings and texts from ancient Sumer, India, China, Japan, Egypt, Pacific Islanders, Native Americans, they all tell the same story. Gods who rode chariots in the sky, gods who created mankind, gods who destroyed the earth with a flood, and gods who helped us rebuild it. Nibiru it's just so crazy, man, that it the, the same stories come from all different cultures all over the world. If you think about stuff like that, y'all, it just make you want to believe that that shit is true. It do. Nibiru is due to return around the year 2900. Now, maybe it will be a gentle transit and humanity will continue to evolve and innovate. Maybe by then we'll have learned a way to communicate with the ancient sky gods. Yeah, you necky. Or maybe Nibiru's next visit will be a violent one, bringing with it another cataclysm that wipes the earth clean. So does that mean all of humanity is destroyed and we have to start again? I don't think so. Technology is gonna keep moving forward. By the time the year 2900 arrives, I'm sure we'll be building outposts on the moon, Mars, Europa, Enceladus. We'll be mining asteroids and stopping at Europa to refuel and refill our water tanks. Humanity will be a space-faring species. And like we've conquered every corner of the earth, I believe with a little luck and a lot of cooperation, we can conquer every corner of our solar system. Nibiru mm. may destroy the Earth in the year 2900, but that's okay, because by then, we'll be the sky gods. The year 2900. That's just hard for me to e even fathom, my brothers and sisters. I'm gonna keep it real with y'all. I don't know if the Earth gonna make it that far. I feel like we're gonna be the killed ourselves before the end. I don't know, man. I don't know. The Anunnaki, the sky gods from Nibiru who traveled to the earth in search of gold, needed to save their planet. And while here, they created the human race as a slave species to mine that gold. Eventually, humans grew too intelligent, greedy, arrogant, and violent. Then they were wiped out in a global flood when Nibiru passed close to the earth. This story is one of my all-time favorites, and it is a classic. The ancient Aliens television series is built around this story. But is it true? Ancient astronaut theorists say yes. I know they do. Almost all the Anunnaki ancient alien story comes from the work of Zechariah Sitchin. His book, The Twelfth Planet, explained how the story is written word for word in ancient Sumerian texts. His first book was such a hit that he wrote a whole series about ancient aliens and their time here on Earth. Wow. Sitchin spent over 20 years studying Sumerian tablets and teaching himself ancient languages. He translated thousands of texts and a legend was born. So who was Zechariah Sitchin? A Sumerologist? An archeologist? A philologist? What in the name of Anu is a philologist? A philologist studies languages that are no longer spoken, like Latin, ancient Greek, Sanskrit, Sumerian, and many others. So, philologist, archaeologist, sumerologist, Sitchin was none of these. He claimed to have an economics degree from the University of London, though that's never been confirmed. While he was working for a shipping company in New York, he taught himself Sumerian cuneiform. He then visited some ancient sites and started to piece together the ancient astronaut theory. Now, I'm a huge fan of Zechariah Sitchin. I've read all of his books many times, and they're brilliant. But? But he was wrong about just about everything. Oh, no. Damn. His translations of Sumerian writing are more interpretations than actual translations. He even gets the meaning of the word Anunnaki wrong. In the ancient texts of Sumeria, the term Anunnaki means those who from the heavens came. Yeah, that's wrong. The Ancient Aliens TV show uses Zechariah Sitchin's translation, not the real translation. Anunnaki actually means royal blood or royal seed. Anu was the king of the gods, and his consort was named Ki. The Anunnaki were descended from Anu and Ki. They became the gods in the Mesopotamian pantheon. Sitchin's book was released in 1976. There was no internet. There were no databases of ancient writing and cuneiform, but now there is. Because we now know so much about how the Sumerians spoke and wrote, we also know that Zechariah Sitchin wasn't a very good translator. He got even basic words and grammar wrong. In fact, the title, The Twelfth Planet, 
refers to the image on the Sumerian cylinder seal VA-243. On the seal, the sun is surrounded by 12 objects that appear to be planets. Sitchin claims that the Sumerians knew of all the planets in the solar system, plus Nibiru and a few other objects. Now, the truth is, the Sumerians did know about planets, but they didn't know of any beyond Saturn. They didn't have telescopes, and Saturn was all that they could see with the naked eye. Uh, maybe the Anunnaki told them. Hang on, I'm getting there. I just gotta say, it's so crazy that Sitchin was like dude had a great career off basically telling i don't want to say lies but half truths or whatever in his books you know what i'm saying D -d misinterpreting stuff getting words wrong like the guy really didn't know what the freak he was talking about in a way he, I don't, I don't want to say he was doing it on purpose. I don't know, but uh, but he actually made a career out of that and got uh, got a huge fan base from that. That's crazy when you think about that. All this just crazy. Other things Sitchin got wrong. Not a single Sumerian text mentions a flying vehicle. Yes, we read about them wow. in other cultures. Ancient Indians wrote extensively about Vimana, giant vessels that could soar above the clouds. And in researching this episode, I learned all kinds of interesting things about Vimana that I didn't know. And if you want a full video on that, let me know. It would be a good one. Back to Sitchin. The Sumerians wrote about gold a few times, but not that much. And there's nothing in the text about mining gold to heal the atmosphere on Nibiru. By the way, Nibiru means crossing. Sitchin interpreted this to mean it was a planet that crossed the Earth's orbit every 3,600 years, but that's not what Nibiru was. Nibiru, or the crossing, was often associated with a solstice. It could refer to an object in the sky that indicated a solstice, or it could mean the sun or possibly a star crossing a certain way during a solstice. Sitchin took this idea and ran with it. He interpreted Nibiru to be a planet, but it wasn't. I'm not sure how he came up with the 3600 year orbit, but if a huge object roared past the Earth every 3600 years, you'd think there'd be plenty of documentation. But maybe it was lost in the flood. Well, now the flood is interesting. Every culture and religion has a flood myth. I think the count is up to 140 and maybe more. Damn. And they're all very, very similar stories. Frequently, eight people are saved, as in the stories of Noah, Utnapishtim, and many others. It's been said that all the flood myths are copied from the others, and that the flood in the Bible is derived from the Epic of Gilgamesh. But when the ancient Sumerians wrote about the flood, even to them, this was an event that happened in their ancient history. The younger Dryas. It could be. I think it probably was. I think all these myths were referring to the same great flood, and they didn't copy each other. I think they all arose independently. The ancient Chinese, Mayans, Nordics, and Polynesians weren't intermingling in ancient times, yet they all tell the same story, probably because it happened. That's true, man. First of all, AJ said that it's like 140 different religions and cultures out here that all got a Noah's Ark, a freaking flood myth. And that is so true that way back then, none of none of uh, our uh, different cultures, it's religions and all that. We were spread out like a motherfucker back then, y'all. There was no way you can get on a, a, fuck, a fucking plane and fly from Asia to North America back then. You know what I'm saying? So... How did it ain't like we all was conversing and come came up with this flood milk together? But some reason this culture that that's way over here in freaking uh Africa, this one that's over here in uh Asia, this one that's over here in Europe, this one that's over here in Australia, all got the same freaking uh flood milk type of thing. That's because more than likely it did happen, my brothers and sisters. I'm sold. I think it happened. I'm not sure how, but I think that flood shit happened. Also, almost as many cultures have a creation myth about a god adding his own essence to clay. The essence could be DNA, and the clay could represent early hominids. Zechariah Sitchin's ancient astronaut theory is considered pseudoscience. His work has been called far worse. So is the story of the Anunnaki and Nibiru debunked? Well, not so fast. Debunkers have been asking for hard evidence, physical proof of the Anunnaki. For thousands of years, the Sumerian cities of Eridu and Ur were myths, but they were eventually found. And in the mm. city of Ur, a tomb was discovered. In the tomb was the skeleton of a queen of the first Sumerian dynasty. The first queen? Yep, 
That would make her a human Anunnaki hybrid. Well, according to the legend, it would. Is she? Sure looks like it. Yahtzee! Hmm. The ancient Sumerian city of Ur had been lost for thousands of years. But in the early 20th century, it was discovered. In 1927, British archaeologist Leonard Woolley discovered the remains of Queen Puabi. She's queen of the first dynasty of Ur, which, if you believe the ancient astronaut theory, places her very close to when the Anunnaki started creating humans. It's been speculated that Queen Puabi was a human Anunnaki hybrid. Her skull was huge, elongated, and the Anunnaki were described as having skulls just like this. There's currently an effort to have her DNA tested, but that project has been met with some resistance. Yeah, predictable. Now, Queen Puabi is not unique. Elongated skulls have been found all over the world. A large number of them have been found in Peru. They're called the Paracas skulls. Oh, let me guess. They're also against DNA testing. They're actually not. Their DNA was tested in 2014, and the results were surprising. The skulls date back thousands of years and have DNA only found in people in the Middle East. Uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Peru is not in the Middle East, is it? It's not. And listen to this. The DNA from the largest skull has genetics that originate in Mesopotamia. They're real! Nah, they're not the well, mainstream science <laughs> doesn't think so. Yeah, mainstream science can go pound. One of the researchers of the skulls, L.A. Marzulli, believes the skulls belong to Nephilim hybrids. And it's interesting that people with Middle Eastern DNA were in the jungles of South America thousands of years ago. Are they Nephilim? Yep. Anunnaki hybrids? Yep. I'll leave it to you to decide. Now, we know Sitchin was wrong about the planet Nibiru. But in 2015, Caltech researchers found evidence of a huge object deep in the solar system. It's a planet about the size of Neptune with an orbit so elliptical it reaches far beyond Pluto. Just like Nibiru. Yep. Wow. Now there are no photographs of it yet, but it's so large that its gravity is affecting the orbits of objects in the Kuiper Belt. Researchers say there is a 98% chance the object is there. Yeah, Nunaki. It was a long-held belief that Homo sapiens' large brain is what made us so intelligent. But a Neanderthal brain was the same size as ours. Now, they weren't simple cavemen. Neanderthals built families, societies, created art, music, and waged organized war. But Homo sapiens eventually wiped out Neanderthals. How? Neanderthals were extremely strong, far more physically powerful than humans. And they had the same sized brain. They should have destroyed us. Why didn't True. they? In 2013, Homo naledi was discovered. Homo naledi are an extinct species of early humans. They had very small brains, only about one third the size of ours. Yet they knew how to make stone tools. They conducted funeral rituals, which implies they had religion or some idea of an afterlife, which also implies they had language. They were very intelligent. So if brain size doesn't indicate intelligence, what does? Well, in 2020, a very interesting study was released by scientists at the Max Planck Institute of Cell Biology and Genetics. They identified a genetic mutation that triggered the faster creation of neurons in the homo sapien brain. The gene is known as TKTL1. Other hominids also had this gene, including Neanderthals, but they all differ from the modern human gene by one amino acid. This small wow. change wouldn't come from crossbreeding or years of evolution. The only time we see a single gene altered this specifically is when that gene is targeted and manipulated with technology, with genetic engineering. By altering this one gene, Homo sapiens are able to grow neurons much faster than any other hominid species, faster by far. For 300,000 years, Homo sapiens didn't change much. They didn't invent or innovate. In fact, Neanderthals were the dominant species on Earth up until about 50,000 years ago. Then something happened. Man suddenly started to create, reason, and invent. Within a few generations, 
Neanderthals were wiped out and Homo sapiens conquered the world. And our species has been rapidly advancing ever since. That gene, TKTL1, with just a tiny tweak, acted like a turbo switch in our minds and made us who we are today. Now you may not believe in the Anunnaki, but you still have to wonder, who flipped the switch? Exactly. Thank you so much for hanging out. Exactly, y'all. That's what I was sitting right there thinking at the end, man. Like, okay, if it ain't the, if it ain't the Anunnaki, then like, what? Out? Why all of a sudden we just like he said, flipped the switch and just started to become so smart and started to advance so quickly. You know what I'm saying? Like pretty much out of nowhere. As humans in society, because for thousands, millions of years, we weren't really advancing. It was a, it was, we was moving at a snail pace. But then something just accelerated us, y'all. What is that something, my brothers and sisters? Anunnaki. Hey, I'm like Hellfish, man. Might be the freaking Anunnaki. I don't know what it is, y'all. Uh, this was, I, I, I will say this, that first of all, this was a great video from uh, the Y Files, and it was, I, the whole time I was watching it, I pretty much knew that this was a fake story, you know what I'm saying, this whole Anunnaki thing, like, it was great science fiction, like, I knew it was fake, man, and a lot of time when I be watching the Y Files, I really be wondering, like, damn, this shit could really be real, but, I feel like this was fake, but at the same time, that question that he asked, it, it was a good question, man. How did the damn light just come on in human brains where all of a sudden we became so freaking smart and just was able to start advancing, advancing, advancing real quick compared to how we was in the past? I don't freaking know, my brothers and sisters. This one right here, I will have a million questions for this freaking video, man. As far as the, uh, the author of this science fiction that the Wi-Fi just basically told us like i said man uh i don't know if he was doing that shit on purpose or he probably did know that he was lying a little bit and now that i think about it he probably know that he was lying but he still built a follow following off that man and even the wife out say he a fan of him you know what i'm saying even aj say he a fan of him and i'm pretty sure that he is respected like a mother in in the what the is going on type of space or whatever space science fiction space science realm science world people like that the science community i'm pretty sure he real respected and uh the last thing and i'm just gonna stop right here my brothers and sisters because i could talk about this forever and ever and ever and ever and ever man but the last thing i'll say is i think it's so freaking cool hold on i got two things to say the first one is i think it's so cool people uh who go back and translate old freaking um scripts uh whatever you want to call it words from like way back in the day when people used to be writing in clay like i think people who are able to really translate that stuff i think that is so freaking cool and the last thing last but not least y'all i'm gonna let y'all go we have been here long enough the last thing last but not least is the peak the people with the uh elongated skulls like, I think that's telling, man. That is telling of something. I don't know what, but I just feel like whoever those people was way back then with them long ass skulls y'all if, if, if we could get some good dna or some good something back from them man i think that would tell us a lot about the history of the human race and i digress i gotta go let y'all go now my brothers and sisters if you made it here this far i appreciate you for being here with me man back to the white files on another good saturday y'all please, please 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 make sure that you hit that like button your comment and subscribe if you ain't did that yet and come on back tomorrow for another mr ball and sunday but until then my friends Remember this, love, peace, and happiness. Stay safe. Don't stop. Keep going. Yeah.